you'll hear a number of different recordings and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You'll hear a man calling a catering company. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, 5 star caterers. Can I help you? Oh yes. I spoke to you an hour ago about the arrangements for our end of term party. Oh, that's right. It's Mr. Saunders, isn't it? Actually, it's Sanders. That's S-A-N-D-E-R-S. -E oh, I'm sorry. I'll just get that down correctly on the form. Okay, Mr. Sanders, sorry about that. No problem. Well, I've got the details you asked for, so I thought I should call you back quickly and book. Good. Let's fill in the form, shall we? Great. First of all, can you give me a telephone number? Somewhere where you can be contacted during the day. Yes, it's 445-6786. Four four five six seven eight six. Okay. And do you have a number where you can be contacted outside of office hours? Well, I'm at work till late in the evening, so use the same number, and if I'm not there, you can leave a message. Thanks. I'll make a note of that. And how many guests shall I put down? Okay, that's changed. So instead of the figure I gave you before of 85, it's now only 50. It's much lower, I'm afraid, because a lot of people can't make that date. That's not a problem. Can you remind me of the date we set? Yes, it's the 25th of June. Okay, that's fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, did you have the chance to look at the tables on the website? Yes, I did. And I think the rectangular tables would be good. The long, thin ones. Yes, um, you could have two of those. The only problem is that they are for 24 people. So, you'd only seat 48 people that way. And if you have 50 guests... Oh, I see what you mean. Two people have nowhere to sit. What about the square ones? You'd have the same problem with numbers. Usually, for 50 people, we find the round tables work well. Not the smaller ones. They only seat 6 people. The ones that seat 10, the large ones. So do you think we should have 5 of those? I think that would work well. Okay, that's what we'll do then. Fine. And have you decided on the menu you would like? Yes, I think so. But I wanted to ask you, we talked about having the three-course meal with waiter service, but in the end, we thought it would be a bit too formal. So that leaves the buffet or the seven-course banquet. How much is a banquet again? A hundred pounds a head. That's too much and too formal. The buffet is fine. Okay. 
So I think I've got everything. We'd need a deposit of 50% of the total. Right. What's the total? Just a minute. Yes, it's 30 pounds a head times 50. So that's 1,500 pounds. 50% of that would be 750 now, with the balance due another 750 on the day. Great. I'll call in tomorrow if that's okay. I can pay you the deposit then. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow then. Okay. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a guide talking to a group of tourists about Buckingham Palace. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Now, of course, Buckingham Palace is instantly recognisable to millions of people around the world. As we pass the palace, I'd like to tell you a few things about the history of this famous building. We think the first house was built here around 1624. In 1674, that house burned down and a new one was built, called Arlington House after its owner, the first Earl of Arlington. Then, in 1703, the first Duke of Buckingham changed the design of the house and the name. It was then known as Buckingham House. The building we see in front of us now has undergone many changes since it was first built. The east front, which is the part we see from the road, was added as part of the work done by Queen Victoria and was completed in 1850. But the palace has remained pretty much unchanged for nearly a hundred years. The last major changes to the structure were made by King George V, who, in 1913, had the east front redesigned as a backdrop to the large memorial to Queen Victoria, which had just been placed outside the palace gates. Since then, only minor changes have been made. I should point out, though, that the palace was bombed seven times during the Second World War, most seriously in 1940, when the palace's chapel was destroyed. Today, of course, it is the home of the royal family, but that wasn't always the case, although they did own most of the land it was built on. It was George IV who turned it into a palace, doubling its size when he became king in 1820. He had inherited it from his father, King George III, who, in 1761, had become the first royal owner of the building, though it was still not used as the home of the royal family, just as a private home for Queen Charlotte. It was known as the Queen's House at that time. King William IV finished the work after his brother, George IV, died. But King William never moved into the palace. In fact, in 1834, he offered it as a new home for Parliament after the Houses of Parliament were destroyed by fire. The offer was not accepted, though, and in 1837, when Victoria became Queen, the house became the main royal residence in London. However, Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, found the house too small, so they carried out building work to further enlarge it. This included building the east front, which I've already mentioned as the part we are looking at now. 
Victoria was also responsible for moving the marble arch, built as a part of the palace itself in the 1820s, to where it stands today, separate from the palace on the corner of Hyde Park. For 20 years or so, the palace was often the setting for huge banquets, dances and musical performances. This period lasted until Prince Albert died in 1861, after which Victoria spent very little time there and the palace was hardly ever used. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. When Victoria died in 1901, Edward VII became king. He was responsible for most of the decoration inside that exists today, and the dark days of the later part of Victoria's reign were fairly quickly forgotten as the palace came back to life. The palace has been in continual use by the British royal family ever since. A lot of people ask me if they can visit the palace. One way is if you're lucky enough to be invited to one of the three garden parties usually held every year. As many as 8,000 people attend these, although most of them do not get to meet any members of the royal family and they don't see much of the inside of the palace. The garden is, however, quite spectacular and it is the largest private garden in London with an artificial lake, 30 different species of bird and over 350 different wild flowers, some of which are extremely rare. Inside the palace there are 240 bedrooms, 92 offices and 78 bathrooms. There are also 19 state rooms which are used for official engagements and ceremonies. Members of the public are only allowed to visit the state rooms and then only in August or September when the monarch is not there. It's worth it though because there's a lot to see in the state rooms including examples of some of the world's best art with works by Rembrandt, Rubens and Canaletto. The tour, which lasts up to two and a half hours, ends in the garden, where you can see more of the outside of the palace not visible from the road. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a discussion among three students who are organizing an international film festival at their college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Thanks for coming to this meeting on such short notice, Anna and Veronica. It looks like we have just become the organising committee for this year's International Film Festival. We've all just met, so perhaps we should start by an introduction with a bit of background from each of us. OK, I'm Anna. I finished three years of a languages degree in Sweden, where I come from. This year I decided to study overseas to get to know a different part of the world. I'm also a big fan of European cinema, especially French and Italian. Those are the languages I majored in, along with English. To me, film is a great way to learn about the rest of the world. 
I was in the film club at my university, so when I saw the notice asking for volunteers, I thought it would be a good way to meet people and get involved in something I really enjoy. Thanks, Anna. My name is Veronica and I come from Italy. I'm doing graduate studies in English literature. I went to some of the films in the festival last year and enjoyed them. I especially liked the video interviews. That was when I decided to get involved. I used to do film reviews for our student newspaper back home. Hi, I'm Chris from Scotland and I'm in fourth year journalism. Cinema is my hobby. Last year I joined the organising committee just like you have now and somehow this year I've ended up in charge. I'm actually able to use my coordinating work on the festival towards a credit for one of my courses. I have to write up a report on the festival with recommendations, so that's an extra motivation for me. So I hope this is going to be a good experience for us all. Okay, where would you like to start? How about a general overview of the festival? I don't really know much about it. Well, the film festival was started by International Student Society five years ago and has grown every year. It is held over four nights during study break. Wednesday to Saturday. Normally we show three films a night. Last year we tried to choose films from different parts of the world that fit together in some way, maybe a similar theme. Or we could feature a type of film like action films or science fiction. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 25 to 30. Who picks the films? It's up to us on the committee to decide. You mean we get to pick all the films ourselves? What a hard decision! There are so many to choose from. Well, that's the fun part. We have this catalogue of independent distributors. The films are listed by language and have a short summary. We just have to go through it to find a good combination of films that will attract an audience. Veronica mentioned something about interviews. How does that fit in? We set up cameras in the foyer of the theatre and did live interviews before, during intermission and after the screening. Anyone from the audience could come up and talk about the film. The Broadcasting and Journalism School set it up and ran the interviews. They were shown on big screens around the lobby and in the theatre. It went over really well. We had a long lineup of students waiting to be interviewed on TV. Everybody wanted their minute of fame. Great idea! Yeah, it worked really well. We should certainly do something similar again. Maybe even develop the idea further, like a website with audience reviews and discussions, so we can get as much participation and involvement as possible. Hey, that's a good idea. Can I ask a question? None of the films are in English, right? Are they dubbed or subtitled? Well, we do occasionally choose a film in English, but only from unusual places where the dialect is so strong they sometimes need subtitles, like the Caribbean or even Scotland. The majority of films in the festival are foreign language, dubbed in English. We've learned from experience that students don't like reading subtitles. Maybe they read too much already. Whatever the reason, the subtitled films get smaller audiences, so we avoid them as much as possible. So how large an audience can we expect and how much does it cost to get in? It costs $5 per film or a $20 pass for the whole event. All 12 films for the real movie fan. We would have broken even last year except for a bad storm on the Friday night. We almost had to cancel the whole thing. But overall, we had a good turnout. More than 2,000 people in four days. Oh, that's what I was wondering about. The financial part. Where does the funding come from? What kind of budget do we have? 
The festival is subsidised by the Student Council. We generate money through advertising and through admission charges. We'll go over the budget in details a little later, but we've got lots of work to do in the meantime. I guess we have to start pretty soon. Well, I think by the 1st of March at the latest. We need to select all the films. Then we have to find some advertisers to sponsor the event. That shouldn't be too hard. We'll just start with last year's list. Our deadline for that should be the middle of March. By the end of March, we need to design the programme. Then we can get posters made up and distributed in April. Like you said, we need some clever promotion. Something to generate interest and get people talking. We have four months to get ready. It should be enough time. OK, where do we start? Let's start by talking about films, since that is the best part, and see what we come up with. What was the best film you saw last year? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer to a group of civil engineering students on the reed bed system for sewage treatment. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about what is now called the reed bed sewage treatment system. This system uses naturally occurring reeds to treat domestic and industrial waste. It's an environmentally friendly alternative to normal systems. You all know what reeds are like, don't you? Those tall plants with hollow stems that grow in wet places, like marshes, for example. Here's how the system works. First of all, an artificial marsh is created. To do this, holes are dug about one metre deep and usually rectangular in shape. They are then lined with clay or plastic and the liner is covered with gravel. After that, a system of tubing is laid, with holes in it, and more gravel is added to cover that. Finally, reeds are planted in the bed. The sewage is brought to settling tanks. From there, it is distributed to the roots of the reeds through the tubing. Note that the waste material enters the beds underground, and remains underground. The reeds conduct oxygen very efficiently through their stems to the roots system. Here, bacteria work to reduce the waste material to basic elements. What comes out of the artificial marsh is water that has been cleaned through a natural process. The purified water leaves the reed bed through a simple outflow pipe. The water that comes out has to be tested. Sometimes it's held in a pond until it evaporates or soaks into the ground. Sometimes, after testing, the water is discharged directly into streams and rivers. Before the talk continues, with questions from the students, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now, as the talk continues, answer questions 35 to 40. 
The reed bed system originated in Germany in the 1970s and installations have been built in a number of countries throughout the world. To give you an idea of the size and appearance of a reed bed installation, an area of 3 by 5 metres approximately would be adequate for a single house. It would look like a pond overgrown with reeds. There are cities with 150,000 people in Germany whose entire sewage treatment requirements are served by reed bed installations which extend for 10 to 20 hectares. There are two wonderful environmental advantages. First of all, reed bed systems are natural composters. As time passes, high grade soil builds up in the beds. The soil can be removed and used for agricultural purposes. Soil produced from waste containing heavy metals would of course have to be tested and the toxic material removed by chemical processes. An additional advantage is that the reed bed can function exactly as a marsh providing a healthy natural home or habitat for waterfowl and other birds, insects, reptiles and mammals. But there are practical advantages to a reed bed system over existing sewage treatment plants as well. At all levels the cost is lower than for normal systems. Labour costs are a fraction of the costs of a conventional system. Typically a large scale reed bed installation will cost 10% less than a mechanical system. They require little maintenance and unlike mechanical systems the efficiency of reed beds increases over time. But before we go any further you must have some questions. Maybe this sounds too good to be true. That's exactly what I wanted to ask. If these systems have so many benefits, why aren't they more popular? Why don't we see them everywhere? As I said, the technology is now almost 40 years old. Demonstration projects of all types have been built and monitored and are slowly convincing regulators of the advantages of the system. But you have to understand that regulating authorities are by nature conservative and resist change. Typically there's a lot of opposition to these systems by manufacturers and by everyone involved in maintaining the conventional systems. Reed bed systems require fewer staff to operate so there would be a decline in the workforce. Therefore unions would resist the change as well. What happens to reed beds in winter? Does the efficiency decrease? The above ground part of the plants die back in cold weather but the roots remain alive and active and the system continues to work just as effectively in winter. As soon as the weather warms up new reeds appear and grow quickly. Is there a problem with mosquitoes in these ponds? Well they're not exactly ponds with standing water. The beds look more like a field covered with long grass. The soil is moist but not like a swamp so there would be no more mosquitoes than in any other field. Remember the effluent enters the beds underground and remains underground. OK let's get into some of the technical details now and I'll answer questions as they come up. That is the end of section 4.